Welcome to day two of SCLO's Maker Week. And we, uh, last night we talked a little bit about um, digital technologies and different aspects about making and how it relates to uh, you and what you can do in terms of creativity and entrepreneurial pursuits and um, just expanding your knowledge. And tonight, this is the second night, we have Clinton Judy here and he's going to talk about coding with your kids. Uh, this is really, to me, a topic of tremendous interest because my wife uh, just informed me a few months ago that she's pregnant. So I'm going to be paying attention uh, <laughs> pretty closely because I'll have to talk to Clinton about this. But we live in an age right now where uh, people tend to think about objects being something you buy. And the reality is, is that never before have we been so able to engage in making of objects, programming them, having them do what you want. If you have a dream, you have an idea, you have a creative interest, you can express it now uh, with the tools that are available. And Clinton's specialty, he works a lot with open source technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, he's one of the founding members of the MakeSpace. And afterwards, I just want to give a little plug for the MakeSpace because there's another event tonight all week in the evening starting at 7.30 after the lectures here. Um, MakeSpace will be having different demonstrations, so some pretty cool stuff, actually. Uh, a flame-powered speaker that shows the sound waves, um, Tesla coils, uh, learning how to make uh, soldering and electronic connections for Ethernet, and what, there's a few others here. What am I missing, Nathaniel? Clint, what else do we have going on over there? Um, we've got the Tesla coil. Yeah, uh, there, I mean, there are 3D printers. Jacob's Ladder Jacob's and ladder. Uh, 3D printing tomorrow. So uh, come over and check it out. It's a really neat space. Uh, Clinton has been working very hard on that. John Stitzinger is another uh, founding member of, of that space. And anyone can come. It's open nice. to the community to go and make. So without any further ado, uh, we'll have Clinton take this away and see what we can, we can learn about coding with your kids for them, or, or how about just how about your kids coding for you, because that's probably where I need to start. They'll get there eventually. <laughs> All right, Clinton, thank you. All right. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Clinton Judy. Uh, I'm the father of two daughters. They're six and eight years old. Uh, I've been teaching them to code. Um, myself, I learned how to start programming when I was in third grade in a small class in Center Hall, where I grew up. Um, so I've been doing it my entire life. I love doing it. I'm going to go over some of the reasons why we're going to do that, or teach our kids to code later. Uh, first off, we're going to start with a one-liner that we're going to write in 60 seconds. So all the adults can start using this immediately if you don't know how to program. How many uh, adults have never written like code that like, actually work for them in their lives? All right, a couple. I think it's going to help them. So we're going to use this program called IFTTT. It's actually a website called IFTTT short for if this then that. We're going to write a program that um, when someone tags your face on Facebook, like in a picture, it'll download it to your computer. So you have just this folder of pictures of yourself on your local computer you can use later if someone asks you for a headshot or something. If someone asked me for a headshot today, I went straight to my Facebook folder. So I'll show you how that works. IFTTT stands for this then that. Uh, there are three steps. First step, you add channels. This is like websites that you use or services that you use. Second step is you say, if this. Third step is, then that. So we're going to go over these right now. First step, we're going to add Facebook and Dropbox channels. Now, I'm going to fly through this. We will repeat this later, Q&A, if you want to. So the first channel, um, you'll sign up on the website. You'll add channels to say, oh, I want to add Facebook. And it'll look like this. You click Connect. Then you'll add Dropbox, and that's the first step. Those are the two services we're going to use. The second one, we're going to click, um, we're going to create a recipe. This is our one-liner, if this, then that. One thing, then the other thing. So once you click on this, you'll click on Facebook, and you get a whole bunch of triggers. So there's one of these triggers, and it's kind of hard to see here, but it says, you are tagged in a photo. So you'll click on that one. Step two is done. Third step. You'll select Dropbox. You'll click on that, select Dropbox. It has an action called Add File from URL. And then you'll get a couple things here. You can just ignore them. It knows how to fill them out for you. It'll figure it out. That's it. You name it, whatever you want to name it, right there. And then you're good to go. 
Um, so this is what mine looks like. And again, I'm trying to figure out where my mouse is. Give me just a second here. Well, it's hard to figure out. Okay. So here are what like, some of my pictures look like. And these are mostly pictures that other people uploaded of me and then said, oh, Clinton Judy's in this picture. And then this automatically figures out when I'm in a picture and downloads it to my computer. And then I have a copy of all these pictures of myself. And that's it. Uh, this is a picture of my, my brothers. These are my two daughters down here at the bottom. That's a good one. I picked it random. All right. <laughs> Okay. So that's a one line you can do in 60 seconds. I guess I already said all that stuff. Okay, so the name of this talk is called Teaching Kids to Code, but you could just call it Teaching Anyone to Code. So the advice in this talk is applicable of any age. If you've never written a line of code in your life, you can use the exact same stuff. Um, a lot of this goes at any level, and we're going to go as young as like three or four years old so you can start doing stuff. I mean, not even on a computer. You can just start learning to think more programmatically. The first question we kind of want to ask is why? Now, I debated putting this topic in the talk because I assume everyone's sort of already interested in it because you're here. But the reason why we want to teach kids in the first place, well, at a basic level, it teaches creativity, problem solving, logic, and communication skills. And kids um, relish the challenge to be creators rather than just consumers. You know, they're full of imagination. They have ideas. They want to build things. Coding little, or teaching kid, kids to code at a really young age is really empowering to them. You know, they just take off with it, and it's suddenly a skill they have for life and not that much time. Beyond that, our children are going to be surrounded by computers for the rest of their lives, on their desks, um, in phones in their pockets, and increasingly embedded into every surface that they work with. The earlier they learn how these devices work, the more empowered they're going to be as they grow. Most of us use computers on a day-to-day -day basis, and we don't know how they work. Our cars that we drive are essentially computers in their own right. They have sensors embedded throughout them, and yet we've never seen a line of code inside our cars that we don't actually know how they work. And if the logic fails, you know, what do you do? Even car mechanics nowadays aren't learning to also be programmers at the same time, and if the logic fails, you have to take it back to the dealership where they hopefully know what to, to do with it if they don't have to send it off to the manufacturer. Um, we all have computers in our pockets, our phones, but most of us have never seen a line that makes those work. And we use those all the time for everything now. Um, finally, we saw the birth of the internet as adults. We saw our lives changed. We used to wait for days for responses in the mail um, from friends and family if we weren't physically close enough to talk to each other. Remember being tethered to the wall via cord to talk to someone, you know, not that long after that. And that's how we communicated. And we, everyone knows already, like, how powerful the Internet is, how freely information flows from one person to another. And we got to see that change. Kids nowadays are embedded in that completely. And there's some sayings about, like, who controls who. You know, some of us, sometimes we feel like we're slaves to our devices. They just tell us what to do and where to go and so on. I'm here about teaching kids to understand and master their roles in an increasingly digital society. Um, let's talk some hard facts. Information technology was one of the science, te technology, engineering, and math fields with the most job postings in the U.S. in 2013. And job postings requiring coding skills stayed open longer than most. Um, a national non-STEM job opening is filled in about 33 days compared to 56 days for jobs that require programming skills and 65 days for mobile developers. Companies want to hire programmers and are having a hard time finding them. So just from a let's give our kids jobs perspective, this is a huge motivation. Um, we're running out of coders. Companies wait longer and longer and longer, and they can't find anyone that can do the work that's necessary uh, meanwhile, there are lots of people that are looking for jobs, and I'm also very interested personally in like teaching people how to program um, that maybe have their jobs taken away by computers in one way or another. Um, and another way, uh, talk about countries teaching code. In Estonia in 2012, they started teaching kids on a, nation, 
nation, sorry, nationwide scale how to program starting in the first grade. Um, there's still electives on some level, level, but in the UK in 2014, they became the first country in the world to mandate teaching code to kids um, starting at five years old and going until they're 16. Every kid must learn how to program. In the United States, we don't have anything on a nationwide level. Um, there are a couple neat initiatives happening. Uh, Google has worked with uh, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, um, rolling out coding classes to every single after-school program in all five boroughs. So, and they have a wonderful after-school program in New York City, and kids can show up to those after-school programs and learn to start programming immediately. That's available to all of them. Um, there are widespread summer camps. Um, a lot more of them have started in Chicago and Baltimore, San Francisco. Uh, this fall, Arkansas is the first state in the country to require all of its high schools to offer programming classes, even if they're not mandatory. Um, I feel like we can go even further than that, and I think a lot of that can start with, with parenting. It's fun to learn how to program and teach your kids how to program, and they'll teach you too. Um, this one to throw in as one final note on creativity. This is one of my favorite sayings, and I felt like it was applicable, so I put it on here. When you don't create things, you become defined by your tastes rather than ability. Your tastes only narrow and exclude people, so create. The rest of this talk is just a big list of things to check out. Um, I have some visual aids. I'm going to show some programming, uh, video game. Kids like video games. So the first one is Robot Turtles, uh, ages three and up. And my youngest daughter, Madison is her name, she started when she was four years old, and she still loves this game. It looks like this is the box art. So you have, I don't know if that'll stay up. So you have a very simple game board, and this is one you play with an adult and like one to four kids. So it's just a system of grids, and everyone has these turtles that they put down, I don't know if anyone can see this, but a turtle you put down on the board, and then everyone can, um, or the, sorry, the adult puts down a, like a maze of little castle figures like this, and then sur solve certain objectives. So they come with jewel cards, and I've made up my own objectives, and my kids and I have even created little stories as they move their robots around the board. So then each kid gets a whole deck of cards, and they're all colored the same way in the back, um, for you know, match, color match to their turtle. And they'll give me cards one at a time saying, OK, now I want my turtle to turn left, or I want my turtle to turn right. So they're doing like logo program of turtles, if you guys remember that from like the 1970s. But it's really interactive. I highly suggest making noises as you move your turtles, blah, 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 blah across the screen, or across the board. Kids love that. Um, so yeah, Madison can now write a program of like eight cards long telling a robot, oh, we need to go forward two and then turn to the right and then move forward two and then turn to the left and then get the jewel. And she realizes the more cards she lines up, the quicker she can win the game and beat her, her eight-year-old sister. So they love robot turtles. Here's a game I just got, actually. It came out this year called Hack and Slash. It's uh, recommended ages 8 and older. Uh, right now, the price is $13.37 on Steam and online. And I was going to show everyone real quick how this game worked. So this is a game that teaches kids how to um, do like ROM programming in a way. So one of the ways that I learned how to program initially was by hacking games. I really wanted to, there's certain games I just couldn't beat, and I wasn't old enough to figure out how to beat them. They required lots of memorization or, you know, more adult level skills. But I knew there were, when I saved my game, my save had to go somewhere. And I was just getting onto the internet with Prodigy on a, like, 33 kilobit, kilo, yeah, kilobit modem. Um, which is blazingly fast at the time, I learned how to modify game files. This game is basically oh, the, the same thing built into the game. So everything is incredibly overpowered. You can't, um, let's go through this real quick. You can't um, like kill enemies or anything else like that. You have to reprogram your enemies. And you do that, you know, in a increasingly um, 
simple steps. Let me try to move forward here real quick. It's a very simple, like, top-down adventure game style. I'm going to go to the very first program thing here. So your character picks up a sword. I'm just going to skip through the dialogue here. You try to attack stuff. It turns out the sword is actually a USB stick. They used to attack the world. So I don't know if you can see this. There's a, you'll see these little ports, these USB ports throughout the world. So you'll, you'll attack them with your sword like that. And throughout the game, so whenever you do something like that, you'll see a list of variables on the right. And I just let my eight-year-old go at this game, and she figured it out instantly. She's like, oh, I need to change open to be true. And now the door is open. And it gets more fun than that. I'll just go to the next program and challenge, and we'll continue with the talk. It's a fun little game, and I actually have fun playing with it. So you push this block to the side, and... Um, you know, you can move blocks out of the way, but this block doesn't move out of the way. Oh, but you see there's a port on the side of it. You attack it, and also, oh, gosh, there's lots of things I can do here. So you can do remaining pushes. Uh, well, I'll give it like a bunch of pushes, an amount of pushes. Tiles per push. Well, you can play around with this game's logic a lot. So you can set it to a negative number. See what happens. Time before push starts. Well, I want it to start immediately. And then push it, and the block starts moving in the opposite direction because it's a negative number. One of the fun things about this game is, fun things, is that you can crash the game. You're actually modifying the game's logic as you move along. Um, you, you gain access to the, the timer in the game, so everything in the game moves faster or slower. Um, you can change the day-night cycle, uh, all sorts of stuff. You can you know, attack an enemy, change it to be on your side, and then it'll start going after the other bad guys, like for you. Like you just go step by step by step. It's very natural. And then about halfway through, you start learning how some of the algorithms around the game work. So you can actually start changing how, like everything works in the game. It's really impressive. It's behind the scenes, it actually uses uh, very modifiable code. And um, I've been really impressed with this game. I could talk for a long time about it. Let me see if I can tab out. Okay. Next one I'm going over is Scratch. Scratch was developed at MIT um, by a couple of professors that were parents that wanted to make it easier for kids to, their kids to learn how to program and not have to worry about doing stuff um, by typing, by just like dragging and dropping code blocks. So you can see some of the stuff here, and I have another example of something very similar later, where you just drag and drop blocks for what you want to do, and things would just plug in if they'll fit or not. And we're going to see a lot of stuff that looks like Scratch in the near future. There's a version called Scratch Junior. Um, this is ages 5 and 7 recommended. Recommended 5 and 7. Um, it's free. You can download it on iPads and Android tablets. Um, you put it on, and the blocks in Scratch still have text in them. Scratch Junior has no text whatsoever. The blocks look like arrows and things like that. And then you, the, you know, your son or daughter can just click on the things they want, see what, what happens, and then drag them over and chain them. It's a very natural progression from Robot Turtle, something like Scratch Jr., and suddenly they're, they're doing these things. And they can move multiple actors, you know, like actors on a stage around at the same time. And it's fun and intuitive. And again, there's not even that much instruction, like, oh, here's what you need to do, here's what you need to do next. They just play with it, and suddenly they're chaining things together. Who here loves Minecraft? Okay, I saw a couple hands go up. Uh, this is another great website, learntomod.com. Um, you can use the same visual programming language. Uh, it's similar to Scratch called Blockly. And it costs $30 a year, um, but you can send them an email and say you want to try it out, and they'll send you a free account so you can try it out. So you'll connect to your Minecraft game, and at a very basic level, you're learning to mod your game of Minecraft. So blocks will do different things, or enemies will do different things. Um, my eight-year-old, her name is London. She loves this. So this is, I took a snapshot of the last program she tried making on this. Um, I'm not sure if it's actually working or not. I didn't try it out, so it might have a bug in it. But she wrote this by herself. So in the main function, so when she runs this, and you can, I'm going to read this out loud. For each item dragon, 
in list. Um, it finds a list of dragons that are within like 10,000 blocks of me. So all the dragons nearby me. And then she would spawn a whole bunch of dragons. For each one of those dragons, it would strike lightning out of the sky. And she built that herself without any interaction from me. It's, it's easy to get into this and start dragging things around and see what happens. Um, it comes with a bunch of programs that people have made ahead of time. And you can open up other people's programs or other people's mods for Minecraft and click them. People have made programs that like make a Christmas tree. So you click a button, it'll make a Christmas tree and then make lights that rotate around the tree. And that, kit, um, that program specifically was written by, I think, an 11-year-old. It's really easy to get around and start doing this sort of stuff. So again, things like Robot Turtles and Scratchy Jr. have on a 2D plane. Minecraft, if you can think in 3D, you can do stuff in a 3D plane by drawing stuff in 3D. Um, it's a lot of fun. I've played with it. Code.org. So this is one of the, the behemoths right now in t teaching kids how to code. Um, There's a huge initiative by many companies, Facebook, Google, Yahoo. I don't know who all was involved. Um, this was the place where President Obama wrote his first line of code ever. So he made, his first line of code was he made Princess Elsa from Frozen move 10 pixels to the right. Fun fact. It's free, and you can dive right into this as well. It uses something very similar to Scratch, the visual programming language. You don't have to actually type anything. You just drag and drop. This is Tinker. So if Code.org is a stripped-down version of Scratch, Tinker is a much more built-out version of Scratch. Um, it uses Blockly, um, but eventually kids can take the programs that write with this and then click on a button that shows them the JavaScript, the actual text code that they're writing. This is a transition to like, oh, by the way, you were writing text programming the entire time. And my kids, like, they'll click that and go, like, oh, my gosh, like, that's... This is what my code does. It's like they're typing code at, you know, nine or ten years old. Um, and you can do a lot more stuff with it. You can draw math art. You can make web apps like mashups and utilities. You can interface with hardware like motors and LEDs and speakers. You can build your own games, uh, side scrollers, physics games. There are 300 Angry Birds clones on Tinker. Uh, you can model science projects for school stuff, and so on. The drawback with this is that um, it has a bunch of introductory courses that are cheap and work really well. Um, the intermediate to advanced level courses are more expensive, like 40 hours of instruction per course for like 50 bucks. But it'll take you, I mean, there are years and years of material on this. So you can go from a beginner level to an intermediate level to an advanced level to you can do this for a living and you can learn all of it through Tinker. Um, Boy, time really flew by. What time is it? Seven o'clock already? Holy cow. Okay. Yeah. Almost. Almost seven o'clock. So I think I still have a couple examples. Okay, so this is Tinker. Um, and this is one example. I loaded this one in. I modified it a little bit. Uh, on start, it says rotation style, so he'll move all around. I think that's kind of silly. Move to left to right. Forever, it will walk, move 10 steps, and then bounce on the edges. They could play, and the guy moves back and forth across the screen like this. Um, and you have all of these drag and drop elements over here. So we can say when, when I press an arrow, or when I um, click on him, he'll move around and do things like that. Um, let me this page and show you. Uh oh. See if the internet will work. The internet was a little sketchy. That might not show up. That's fine. Um, Code.org lets you do very much the same thing. You have small blocks you drag and drop over. Again, it starts at a very basic level. Um, it also uses a lot of elements from popular culture. So Angry Birds are one thing. Um, my daughters are playing Plants vs. Zombies. Any kids play Plants vs. Zombies? A couple. Um, there are elements from that. So you have to have the zombie walk to get to the sunflower, basically. Um, and again, it's to say, oh, move forward three, turn, move forward three, and so on and so forth. So all the approaches that I brought up during this talk are at a very young level. And when you get past 12 years old or so, things explode dramatically. You know, Learn to Mod was one of those, and that's gaining a lot of traction right now. It's Minecraft. 
kids love Minecraft. I'm like, we need to find out how do we can make it easier for kids to learn how to mod Minecraft. Um, that's my talk so far. Any questions? Is that it? Thank you for letting me talk. No. I know it's a real fast crash course through a list of technologies. That's the, the, the basics. So um, this might be a really good time for the audience to ask questions for Clinton, uh, specific ways that you can get your child started in coding, uh, age-specific advice. Um, any particular games that you think are worth uh, engaging in, etc. So, who has, who wants to be bold and step forward with a question? <laughs> any age, youngsters as well. You in the dapper hat, because you look like you've got something to say. What's your name? Ada. Ada. Here, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the microphone, <laughs> so you can. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <sighs> well, I think. Like some pe people don't like Minecraft, so I think like they would tr like try to do some other games mm -hmm. too, because like um, like Plants vs Zombies was a good like idea too. That what I think. Like I don't know some other games there would be. Uh, I don't know what else. Do you just want to play games, or do you want to make games? Games. You know, All right, games. so how does he start? How Absolutely. old are you first? 12. 12 years old. All right. Yeah, so... Um, Thank you. Yeah, if you want to do, like, something similar to Plants vs. Zombies, um, you can take some of the, like, the images of, like, the zombies and the plants. Um, I would open up Scratch, and um, there are even versions of Scratch for, like, tablets or phones, um, if you find that's easier to use instead. And then you can, or you can even draw your own zombies or plants or what, whatever you want to use. And then you say, okay, well, I'm going to click on the zombie and go, okay, well, it's always going to try to move towards a plant. And you might find that it moves to a plant too fast or too slow or whatever. So you drag it out things going, okay, well, it'll move at this speed and then it'll start moving towards plants. And you can say, okay, well, what do, what do I want plants to do? So you click on a plant. I'm going to drag a couple of plants in. Um, and you can just slowly add things to the, the plants. So plants will shoot pellets at the, the zombies. I guess I'm trying to remember exactly how Plants vs. Zombies works. But you could recreate the game yourself. Or you could do a Plants vs. Zombies um, version of, ping, of um, Pong, where you have two plants on this side, and they bounce the zombie back and forth. Like, the world opens up when you learn how to program. You can program games like this really easily. Uh, Code.org is the easiest way to start learning, I think. And then you can go from that into Scratch or Tinker or whatever and just start putting stuff together. It's so, a lot of fun. So who, what age is just too young? I mean, can a two-year-old learn to code? Probably Six. not two. I think once you're old enough to walk around, if you have... I'd say when a kid has like 10 minutes of attention span at one time. I'm almost 50 and I'm still waiting. All right. But if you get, you know, if it gets, you know, old enough to like sit down at a table and like, you know, want to play a board game or something like that, like you can get robot turtles out and say, okay, here are your cards. This card makes them move forward and this, these cards make them turn. And then just, you know, just try giving me a card, see what happens. And then they'll give you a card you know, blah, 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 and move your robot. And you just start interacting with it like that. And then they get bored with it, like, all right, you know, okay, well, whatever, it's fine. Oh, tomorrow, if we play this again, there's going to be a jewel, I'm gonna, and you're going to have to try to find the jewel on the board. All right, so, so who, who's, got an, who's got a question here? To answer this kid's question, if you want to make games, look for the program Game Style. It's like a what you see, what you get program, kind of like the coding. And it'll let, let you make. Yeah, let me give you the microphone so everybody can hear. If you're interested in making games, look for a game program called Game Salad. It will help you make games without coding. It's just drag and drop. And I think it's on PC. There's one for Mac, too. Mm -hmm. Game Salad. 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 Like game lettuce. Salad. Um, there's another one out there. I can't remember the name of it right now. And to answer somebody else's question, Code.org starts at kindergarten. Mm -hmm. They have a lesson plan that starts at kindergarten. I think they're up to course four now. Yeah. But the introduction is harder than course one, two, and probably three. Like the introduction spans all, I would say, the first three courses. Mm -hmm. And it gets really hard at the end. 
So I would actually just skip the introduction and start working course one, two, and three okay. up that way. There's a lot of overlap too, so you'll, you'll be fine. But, um, and there's some other stuff on the iPad, like that actually Robot Turtles might be on the iPad, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. I said my, my eight-year-old made it almost the way through the introductory course, and you're, you're right, near the end, it's... I think it's hard. Yeah, but they, they have you drawing like circles and things like that with the turtle by making, you know, it helps if you know how many degrees are in a circle and things like that. That's but, what we had problems with was the degrees. Yeah. Right? Other than that, they were okay. I think it's really hard introduction. Yeah. They had mentioned the Make Space in the beginning. Uh, is there anything available outside of Maker Week for kids at the Make Space? Uh, assume you take your daughters there. I do take my daughters there. We've been there a couple of times. Um, we have 3D printers there. Um, I heard recently that they got a laser cutter there, and I haven't seen it yet. Um, but my daughters have built some things with that. Um, eventually, I'm going to get into. Um, it's a very basic 3D modeling, or at least like some of the cookie cutter stuff, you know, we'll, we'll do at home. And I think you know more about that. The cookie cutters, yeah. How many of you did cookie cutters today? Anybody in here? All right, so you designed your own cookie cutter. Um, yeah, we had 120 different cookie cutters designed today, and we should be able to print them by about 2018, we'll be done, <laughs> given the reliability of the printers. But you know, I'm hearing, and I'm gonna hear some more questions, but I'm hearing a great idea to extend this into a make space for kid coding mm -hmm. workshop. Hint, hint. <laughs> right? Well, that's, well um, I'll go over some of these uh, things real quick. So I have, um, I'm gonna mention the workshops again, tomorrow at 11. I think for about two hours. Um, we're probably going to do that here, or we'll, we'll find a room in the library to do that, and then all day on Saturday. Um, so I'm recommending everyone bring mobile devices. And um, there are a couple of different programs we'll, we'll try out, but I want to make myself available to anyone that like wants to start getting into it and show people, oh, here's how a loop works. Here's how you know all this stuff works. You can do it on a cell phone and start dragging blocks around and playing around with it like that. Um, I'm also running the Robotics Club at Young Scholars this fall. I don't know if any of you are in Young Scholars or no other family that's going there. But um, uh, they reeled me in to do that. So I'll be teaching the Robotics Club at Young Scholars on uh, the after school program. And lastly, I was going to gauge interest actually for um, teaching kids how to code as an after school program. Um, at the make space or elsewhere this fall or maybe next spring. Um, like an after school small group, like no more than five or six kids at a time per session and we'll all like make our own video games or whatever. This it's, sounds like a survey question. How many, show of hands, how many people in this room would be interested in something like that after school? Couple. All right. Yeah, I see like it, about eight. Okay, all you right. had a question or a comment here. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, sure. I'm, I'm interested in sort of the tactile side of it, and you just mentioned robotics. And, um, uh, you know, I wonder if you had any comments about, you know, the Lego Mindstorms. Um, yeah. And I know, well, I don't know. I, from what, I, what I've seen, it seems like it, it's, it's to a slightly older uh, group of kids, maybe starting, I don't know, eight, nine, ten, mm -hmm. older. Um, my daughter is five, and she loves her Legos but I would love to get her started with something like right. that and you know, just so that she can get her hands on things and see things moving mm -hmm. um, at the same time. So I was just wondering, one, if you could just talk about legal mindstorms in general, but then if you know of anything that appeals to slightly younger, or I don't know, maybe, maybe they can yeah. be used for younger well, kids. Well, most maybe. of what I've gone over is, is stuff that I've used, and I actually forgot to bring that up. Um, we actually have a mindstorms kit at our house. Um, it's a bit older, it's like a decade old, and I, I think my source has changed a lot since then. Um, they used to have a hard time wrapping their head around it, knowing how to plug things in and like structurally, like, oh, I need, I need some sort of clearance above my wheels so things will actually turn and, and so on. Um, I'm guessing 10 or 11 might be a good age to start them on some of that stuff. Um, that said, like I said, I, they're teach, having me teach robotics class for first through fifth grade. 
this far. I'm still figuring out how I'm going to do that. <laughs> some very basic coding stuff. Um, some of it I'm just going to do like simple machines. So um, they have Lego kits that are, there's just a lot more than mechanical parts. So no motors or anything else like that, but you can learn to um, like create like a small pair of scissors with a set of Legos and you go, okay, well, you can hinge these at certain points and now you have something that, that will like, you know, shrink down and then you press it like this and it'll expand out a certain size. And um, learn to do other machines like, you know, simple just hand motion sort of stuff because learning mechanics is just as important as learning how to send signals to motors to make them turn into things like that. Um, but even at a really young level, I mean, Legos are a great place to start in terms of learning to, to build stuff and how things must connect at a tactile level. Yeah, I feel like this, this question needs just some slight translation because I'm hearing how many parents in this room want an excuse to go out and buy Minecraft Legos and use their child <laughs> as the reason to do that? Just okay. a show of hands. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, who has another question or comment? Yeah. Hold on here. Start with your name. You want to hold this? You want me to hold it? Um, doesn't matter. My name is Seth, and I've heard that you could wipe a CD disc and then program it. I want to know how you program the wiped CD disc. How to program huh. a CD? To you, wipe it. To, to wipe it. And then program it. You, you need a rewritable CD. Uh, I haven't seen one of those in a while. Uh, <laughs> What's a CD? It's oh, a. Like, it's not like an LP. Like it's an just album? like a smaller record. <laughs> it's um, like an eight track. Yeah. No. Yeah. You can. <laughs> um, I I get disposable CDs if I still have to write on them. Um, yeah, you need a program that'll write on your CDs for you. I haven't written on a CD in a long time. Someone else might be better, more, better qualified to answer that question than I am. But you, you, so let me ask, you, <laughs> you want, I mean, there are programs that do that already. So you want to figure out how to write a program to do this? Because CDs are retro, right? Is that what's going on? <laughs> he wants to know how to write a program to wipe a CD so that you can rewrite on it. You can just write over it. If it's a rewritable CD, you just keep writing on it, and you can rewrite it several times. You don't have to wipe it. It's already there, but you can only rewrite it. I think they say so many times, but it used to be not be that much. So once you put data on there, you can keep putting data on there. And if you want to erase data, you have to rewrite over the same regions that your data is on. Like wiping a hard drive. Wipe a hard drive, you have to rewrite over that data multiple times. So if someone goes back in, they can't find the data on the hard drive. So it's like you when you write on a piece of paper and you erase it, you know how you can still see your writing? So you go and you write again, you erase it again. Write again, you erase again. And that's what you're doing on your hard drive, you want to wipe something out. On your CD, you just rewrite. It'll be like erasing and rewriting. That's all you have to do. You don't actually have, you shouldn't have to do anything. Your computer should do it for you nowadays. But you need a special kind of CD if you're going to rewrite it. I think that's all they sell anymore. The rewritable? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you can find a CD. Does that help? Does that answer your question at all? Okay, for now. I mean, there are programs that do it, but if you want to learn how to write programs, that's probably a big job to... to you're, you would be reinventing something that exists, which is educational. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What, the, what resource do you have that makes making an actual mobile app as approachable as possible for a kid? Um, Did you all hear that? How, how do you how do you accessibly make a mobile app for a child? It, yeah. The, the, yeah. One of the the programs I've been playing around with, and I was going to get my kids on, is Pocket Code, um, and that runs entirely on your phone. It's a it's a phone version of Scratch, basically. Um, very same, similar concept where you have multiple actors on a stage. You click on an actor and say, oh, I want it to move around if I do this. Um, one of the, the programs that comes with it is like a whack-a-mole game. So 
most will come up at a random period of time, and you, you tap the most to do that, and then you can see all the code that, that makes that work in little block formats. Um, and it's, uh, I have it on my Android phone. Um, I'm not sure if it's on iOS yet. Um, I think there's an iOS version called Hopscotch. It's worth checking out. Uh, I don't have an iOS phone, but um, I've heard a lot of really good things about that. No, 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 no. Um, in other words, does it, does it end up giving you an actual distributable path? I, I know MIT, again, MIT, was working on something that would, and not on iOS, but it would let you drag and drop blocks, and you would end up with something that you could like install on an, an Android phone or tablet, and you could give to your friends, and they can install on their phones or tablets. I'm not sure that's out yet. Um, at least like MIT App Workshop or something like that. Game Salad does that, or it used to. Game Salad, where you, if you want to make a, pro, a game, you can get it. If it's not Game Salad, look for Game Salad Alternatives, but you can make the game and then it will automatically convert for Android or iOS so you can publish to their stores. It's not Game Solid, it's their competitor, which I cannot remember the name right now, I can't remember But it's out there. Okay. Um, but they will, you can make the game, and they can it'll convert for you so you can publish it. Okay, yeah. anybody, anybody else? Questions, comments, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, I know almost nothing about computers in general, or this <laughs> certainly specifically, and I have a 12-year-old who's interested in programming and code, and mm -hmm. um, what, he, are there like human resource, like people in State College, either through the school district or around, like, I'm just wondering, you know, can a kid jump on a computer and go to these sites and just mm -hmm. kind of teach himself, like if his mom doesn't know anything, or yeah. are, are there people that, you know, when he runs into questions or he, you know, that he could take classes from to help? I mean, it sounds like maybe tomorrow you're yeah, doing that, I, I know, but I'm just um, wondering, you know, where to turn to. Yeah, uh, for parents I mean, th there's a growing number of offerings throughout the school district. Um, I don't know, like, state colleges, um, like their middle schools or high schools directly. Um, but, you know, they, they have a robotics club at Young Scholars that goes you know, covers the, the entire age range now. Um, and they're thinking about also adding coding classes separately from that. Interest is growing a lot. For hands-off stuff, code.org and Tinker, um, I just let my eight-year-old run wild on, on those. Um, I, I opened it up for her, showed her the introductory course, and over a span of a couple of days, she spent a total of, I don't know, two or three hours just going through, you know, section by section by section, learning how to drag and drop these blocks on, figure out how everything worked. Um, I only had to step in like once or twice. And then um, again, as, as the, the gentleman in the back said, uh, near the end of the introductory course, it gets really hard, but they have a lot more courses on there now. You can bounce from topic to topic, and eventually you can get into like JavaScript or Ruby programming. Um, so most places teach that. Another website, if, if you want to start learning text programming, so it's like called Code Academy. Um, that's excellent for learning how to program with, you know, text. Um, very similar concept, though. I just wanted to say that Code.org does give you the answers. So, yeah. I'm I'm a homeschool. Are you homeschool? Are you? Oh, okay. As you look from there, um, I homeschool and I have my kids set up as a class, so they can't see the answers. I can see the answers. So if they get stuck and I can't figure it out, which in course three, there's some, it gets tougher, um, I can go look at the answers and see what they're doing. So if you do code.org and just set him up as a, like the teacher, if he gets stuck, he can go in and look at the answers and um, see where he's going wrong. Okay. No, so if you go into code.org, I set up my own class, my student, my kids are my class. Okay, so I'm the teacher. So they can't see the answers, but they can log in, they do their lessons, and then I can track and make sure they did their schoolwork for the day. So, but I can see the answers to every problem. I can look at it and give them the answer or help them or guide them to find the answer. Does that make sense? 
if your son was on by himself, you know, he would be able to, it's like turning the page in a book. Yeah. yeah. There's an answer key on the bottom left. You click see answer, and then he can see the answer. So if he does get stuck. Yes. And then he can look at it and figure out where he's going from there. Yeah. At 12, though, he will probably fly through code.org. I mean, he could probably work on it. Because my kids, they started when they were 7 and 8. And they flew through the first three levels pretty quickly. So... Um, I'm not sure. He'll have to go on to some other stuff. But he could it'd be a good place to start. And then I have one other thing to add to what you said. Yeah. Is you're talking about coding. I don't know that there's that as many jobs for coders as what you say. I think the job market is more for specialty people. Mm -hmm. And so for my kids, they're taking apart computers. And we're going to build our first PC. Um, I've also had them check out the modem, the Wi-Fi, so mm -hmm. they understand where the signal's coming from, and to look at some of this other stuff and not focus so much on coding. Because mm -hmm. I think if you focus too much on coding, there's a lot of people who code, and a lot of people who teach themselves to code. And I don't know that the job market is so much towards coding, it's more, can you do this other stuff? Because a lot of people do well, code. When I, I guess when I, when I say coding, it's, it's not just like writing small scripts to put things together. It's a lot of it's on a bigger picture, knowing how computers work, that they take one instruction at a time, that things are put together in a very specific way. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of these skills are not just about like, learning how to code, they're also teaching kids how to communicate with each other and eventually as, as adults to give instructions on how to do things. Um, teaching them to be expressive and learn how to express themselves and be creative in those sorts of endeavors. And then beyond that, eventually they'll start learning basic math skills and. Um, and, you know, yeah, that's where I was heading. Well, I just wanted to comment to what you said. I've been staffing for government contractors for years now and um, for IT government contractors, and there are thousands upon thousands of job specs that come out on a daily basis for coders, Java, Ruby, on a daily basis that the government is having a hard time staffing because people aren't learning coding anymore. They're it's being overlooked in colleges and, and universities, so they're having such a hard time staffing for these positions when they're desperately needed. Would you say they're over-specializing then? Are people over-specializing into certain fields, or they just don't know that code? No, no. people people are, they're not looking at, at Ruby anymore, on, for Ruby on Rails, for example. They're not, uh, they're not just not, they're not learning it, and so people aren't, putting that on their resumes or they're not saying, okay, I'm a Ruby on Rails programmer, so I need to, you know, I'm, tr I'm gonna go and try and do network solutions or whatever. They're not, basically, where these contractors are having a hard time staffing is mainly the programming positions. Because you can find a project manager anywhere, you can find these people anywhere other than coders because kids aren't being taught coding anymore. I was thinking more like database managers. Um, and they have, they have an overabundance of database managers. They, yeah, so they're having a hard time finding guys, or finding kids, people, mm -hmm. who can do Java, who can do Rubies. Ruby, especially, mm -hmm. like they're having such a hard time finding people who specialize in Ruby, where these government, the government basically, they're not up to date on most programs and stuff, so they're still running off of Ruby. They're still running off of basic programs. Right, so they need these kids that do the old stuff and the new stuff, you know. So that's why I think what, what Clint is doing here today is really important because this younger generation, they could be at, you know, the, the start of something awesome. But is Ruby going to be used by anybody else in the workforce? Because the government doesn't update. Like because it's not just government, it's government contractors. So, you know, here in State College, for example, um, Applied Research Lab, for example, they have tons of positions here for programmers, and they can't fill them. You know, so it, it, I think you know it's important to teach your kids mm -hmm. at a young age. Um, Clint's two kids are at a major advantage yeah. because they can already do it. You know, I was saying it's and you can you can learn how to program later in life, but it, it I feel like it becomes more like learning any other kind of skill where there's a lot of initial hurdles and, and things you have to you know, get your mind into a new way of thinking. Where, you know, we, we've heard the research um, 
we've heard the research where kids that learn a secondary language, you know, if they already grow up speaking English in their household and you start teaching them Spanish in their first or second grade, they adapt to it much more quickly because, I don't know, I, I'm not a scientist, I don't know how all that stuff works, I can't explain it very well. But they're able to pick up other languages very quickly and it's, it appears that kids learning how to program, it, it works in much the same way in that they don't have to change how their mind works. Their mind is already adaptable to learning like, oh, I just have to do things like this instead. And then they can adapt to that very quickly and dive in when they're kindergarten or first or second grade. It's, it's, it's really surprising. I mean, like I said, I watched my, my eight-year-old go through all of it and my six-year-old is starting to go through it and it's nothing. I, I put them in front of the computer and be like, ask me if you have any questions and I just stand back and watch them. And they just start going course through course through course through course through course. My six-year-old reads at a pace of like one word every three seconds. And she knows how to make a robot move through a maze by lining up like you know, eight or ten instructions at once. So, so uh, for all of you parents, I know one of the big questions is not just you know, where do you start, but ultimately where do you go? And for me, one of the questions I have is... What languages should one focus on? Now, programming has core concepts that are shared, and there are basic patterns that you need to understand. But ultimately, when you start to extend that into a depth in one language, so what is it? What are those predictions? I, I ask a lot of my computer programmer friends this question all the time. And, uh, you know, I would say... Ruby on Rails, yes, there's, there's one, right? Java, there's another. But what about something like Python? Um, what are others? So, you know, what, what are the languages that are hot now or hot tomorrow, in your opinion? And, and anyone can answer that, and I know you had another thing that might be related. So, does anybody have any feedback? Clinton, you... You seem pretty up to speed. Yeah, no, this is. You're gonna ten different answers. You have ten people. We got we got thirty people here. Yeah. Nathaniel. I'll speak up. We've had a number of requests at the library for training materials on Swift. So that's the new Swift, Apple yeah. Apple is Swift platform. The new thing? Yeah. Is, it, is it going beyond Apple? So I don't know if you know Swift. It's the new Apple programming language. Did you have more to add, Nathaniel? Yeah. Okay. I mean the quote, new hotness seems to be JavaScript, which is one of the funniest things for me as a web developer. I've been programming JavaScript, yeah, since I was in high school. And um, for the last five years, it's seen a resurgence in popularity. Um, you can write JavaScript on the back end now, like on, on your computer to, to make games and things like that. There are JavaScript engines that work on phones. Um, beyond just having JavaScript on a web page, which is where most people see it, for doing basic stuff. Um, people are writing massive things with JavaScript now. Um, I personally program with Ruby. Um, I still recommend it to a lot of people that want to get into programming um, that can type and are okay with learning a, a typed language because um, it's very easy on syntax. A lot of people get scared with parentheses and semicolons and brackets and like knowing what all those things are for. Ruby is very, it's term laissez-faire, like hands off in terms of if you don't put parentheses around something. Well, if it can figure out what, what you mean, yeah, it's fine. It'll figure it out. It's and a it'll conversation. Just, it'll language. just run it, yeah. So you're, it's more like you're talking with your computer rather than having to try to speak the language your computer speaks. Um, okay, I, there's a comment here comment on what she was saying. You had said that you had started teaching, you started learning in center hall in the third grade. I think mm -hmm. you're looking for something a little bit more hands-on for your, for your child. Well, I'm just wondering what classes are available at State College or the school district. So maybe that's something you should consider, especially with the make space, getting that out to people like that so that there's yeah. programs for kids to be able to start um, attending and learning. Oh, hang on a second. I didn't know there's a screen saver on this. My email address is at the bottom, clinton at j-udy.com. I don't know if it's easy to see up here. And then my Twitter handle is right above that. If you want to send me an email and you're interested in doing something like this, like I said, I'm still gauging interest in talking to people. Um, 
I'd love to, I mean, it's, it's something I've always wanted to do, actually, was, was um, teach kids how to program, like, the same way that I learned how to program. That's one of my best memories growing up. Um, if anyone's interested, I would love to teach a class on that. In the fall, we can get a, or even get a freeform group going at the, the make space, come and go as you please, or we can do uh, more formal, um, like, coursework in the fall. I don't know. Along those same lines, uh, Nathaniel Rasmussen from the library here. Um, I'm, you may have heard me make the spiel before. If you haven't seen the posters like on the podium here, we are doing a survey for Maker Week in general. And I, we would love your input on things like this. One of the things that we talk about at the library a lot is what do we invest our money in for resources for our community. And we're looking at things like lynda.com, for instance, which mm -hmm. I know teach a good number of things, and other uh, programming resources that are maybe some of the paid things that you talked about that right yeah that um, we could license as a community and then it would be free for library card holders so anything that you want to contribute um, in terms of your your feedback on that kind of thing would be very helpful we'll make sure that 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 information gets to the decision decision makers thank you I'll put in a giant plug for lynda.com actually uh, this is pre LinkedIn purchasing it I mean that's really crazy uh, so who knows what's going to happen because now you've got this educational entity linked up with this entrepreneurial um, business building entity. So I'm, I'm not sure, but I can vouch for the content of LinkedIn.com uh, when teaching at university level students. It's a very, very big resource for university professors for application specific learning. So it's extremely well done. So yes, if SCLO <laughs> were to get uh, memberships and people could do it, Absolutely. So if you find a program or something you're interested in and uh, lynda.com has something in that, highly recommend it. Um, one thing I'm going to nominate, lynda.com, lynda.com. Um, I would nominate you, Clinton, to take, uh, I, I hear a lot of age-specific questions, and I think that if, if you had a couple of minutes Maybe if you were to put together sort of just like, these are some ages, here's where you might start. Mm -hmm. And this relates to gaming, apps, or programming, you know, just sort of categories. Maybe, maybe just like a handful of resources that could be posted on SCLO's uh, website. Yeah. To me, that seems th to be a really great resource. Would that help those of you here? You know, just a kind of just a little overview. Okay, now we're running out of time here. I, I don't know if anybody has any other Questions or comments? Yes. I'm Sammy, and does ITTT, does it work on more than just Facebook? IFTTT? Yeah, it works on a lot of stuff. Um, I wish the internet was working. So I, I have a, a bunch of recipes that I'm running right now. Um, so there's one called the Sunlight Foundation, which does political stuff. So I have a recipe that emails me whenever the president signs a new bill into law. That one's a lot of fun. Um, I have one that posts on Twitter every time I post on Facebook. So I post on Facebook and then it automatically copies it over to Twitter and that's on IFTTT. Um, you can hook a lot of things up. IFTTT has also been doing a lot of stuff with home automation. So um, you can buy like a plug that you plug into your wall and then connect to IFTTT and then hook up to like anything else. So it, you could say, it's kind of off the wall, but you could post on Facebook saying, turn the lights out. And then IFTT will look for that message. When you post that, it'll turn the lights out in your home. You can hook anything up. That might be a really bad idea, but you could do that. <laughs> uh, so IFTT, it, it's just a really fun way to find like really practical things you can start building immediately. Um, I think what else it does, it'll hook up to light bulbs, so you can change colors of lights depending on different things with um, smart homes you think about it yeah, i want to make stuff. one that says if i wake up and i have a robot bring me coffee you know mm -hmm. just right there i just want to wake up and then there's the coffee it's not too far away actually i mean you can you can do time stuff on ifttt so you can say oh when it's eight o'clock turn this plug on and then plug that plug into yeah. your coffee maker and then it'll turn i mean coffee makers are already programmable but you know we're getting crazy here yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I have, no, I just remember another recipe I have. Um, when it's supposed to rain tomorrow, I have a to-do list program, and it automatically adds an item to my to-do list, so it'll ping me in the morning, 
saying, oh, it's going to rain today, remember your umbrella. And then I, I put my to-do list in the morning, I go, oh, that's right, it's, it's going to rain right now. I check it off, grab my umbrella, and go out the door. Yeah. Um, fun stuff. I think yeah. is a lot of fun, that's why I started with that. Um, it's fun having a whole folder of like all the pictures people have tagged you in on Facebook. There's a lot of pre-programmed recipes, so all you mm -hmm. have to do is just go in and pick them. Uh, I so I checked it out while Clinton yeah. was speaking, so I had to do that. So thank you all.